Hi, everybody. Welcome to the first step of the green card process. My name is Giselle Carson. I am a business immigration and compliance attorney. I have the honor and privilege to work with many of you. So thank you for being here with me today. Um, I'm doing this webinar in part because I received so many questions about the green card process. Well, we were going through the H-1B um, lottery and thereafter. So um, here we are. And again, this is for you all. The majority of the people are on this call today are clients. Um, and so I'm doing it for you. If there is other topics of interest, please let me know. I, I This is everything that we're doing is to save you time, give you a peace of mind. So. Um, we're going to talk about the first step of the green card process. And as I go through this, some of you, this may not apply uh, specifically because you may not have to go through all of the steps. So just keep that in mind. Um, I am also honored and privileged to work with a phenomenal group of ladies. Uh, those that work with us know Tyra, I know Ellen, and you are going to start to get to know Daniela, um, who uh, not replaced Gabby, but Gabby had left for a different opportunity. So Daniela is with us now. And uh, we, again, all of us appreciate you and, and we're here to help you. So what we're going to talk about um, primarily is the three steps of the green card process. And so I want you to understand two things. So the way we look at it and many immigration attorneys look at it is three steps to the green card process and, and the whole process from the beginning to the time that you get a green card. And then within those three phase or steps, the perm of the labor certification, which is the one that I'm gonna be talking about today also has its own kind of three phases. Again, that is gonna be the main topic of this today. Um, and those three phases, the primary steps are um, the job description and the requirements of, for that job and the prevailing wage discrimination. And I'm gonna go into a specifics into each one of them. Um, then the recruitment and the perm filing and the labor certification. Now I have here um, Q&A, but again, this is all for you. And I see that some of you are using the chat and I very much appreciate it because uh, questions are gonna come up as we go through the presentation and many others may have the same question and I rather oh, comment and I rather address them as we go. That also keeps you engaged. So to make sure that you're all listening to me, go ahead in the chat and give me their thumbs up and let me know that you're hearing me. Um, so come on, let me let me see you participate in the chat. Are you hearing me well? Yes, no. Okay, awesome. Fabulous. Yes, okay, I love it. I very much appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, you're with me. Okay, so here is the big process, okay? This is taking right now anywhere from, I'd say the minimum is two years and the maximum, it could be 10, okay? From the moment we begin the labor certification to the moment some of you may be getting a green card. The first step of that green card process is Again, firm labor certification that we're going to talk about today. And I know I'm repeating myself, but for some of you, this is brand new. For some of you, you've heard this several times. So just bear with me. I'm going to go from foundation to more deep. Second step of the green card process is the immigrant petition. That is typically when the labor certification has been certified by the Department of Labor. And then we move we move from the Department of Labor to USCIS, back to USCIS, to process an immigrant petition. 
I tend to tell people that don't know this process, the I-140, which is the immigrant petition, it's almost the equivalent of the I-129 in the non-immigrant bucket, okay? So we're moving from the non-immigrant world to the immigrant world where we have the I-140. And then when that R140 is approved, then we can move on to step three, which is actually the final step, which is where you get the green card. How quickly we move to a step three depends in many factors, including the priority date that the foreign national has based on the filing of the labor certification, okay? And then this flowchart has some of the steps underneath, but that is the big picture from labor certification all the way to green card. Questions so far? Okay, everybody understands the whole picture. Now, moving on to, awesome, okay. Moving on to preference, category, preference categories. So the employment-based, that's what ED means in my world, employment-based preference categories, there are five of them. The ones that we use the most and the ones that most of you on this uh, call are, is, they're, is relevant to is the EB1, EB2, EB3. Most of you in this call are gonna be in the EB2 and the EB3 category. Okay, but I'm touching on the other ones so that you know that they exist. And actually for some of you on the call, the EB-1 may be where you land at some point. The EB-1 is the first preference category is for extraordinary ability persons. They are at the top of the field. They have to show that they're at the top of the field by way of many criteria requirements and whatnot. It's also used for outstanding professors and researchers and for certain multinational managers and executives. So if a manager executive is, is transferred from abroad, it comes into the United States in that, in that L1 category, typically they move into the EB1. Someone that is on an O1 or an O1B can potentially move into an EB1. So and if that is the case, no perm is required. So no labor certification is required. So this first, this, this first uh, step that we're gonna talk about right now would not apply to those people. They move right into the I-140 immigrant petition in most cases. For most of you, it's the EB-2 category that will be relevant. The EB-2 category, includes those with exceptional ability, national interest waivers, and advanced degree professionals. Again, most of you in the call are probably in the advanced degree professionals because you have a master's degree or the job requires a master's degree or a bachelor's degree plus five. For the national interest waiver and the exceptional ability, no perm is required, but for the, um, advanced EB2 and the EB3 categories where the bachelor's or master's degree is required, that is what the PERM comes into play. And that again is what we're going to talk about today. Okay, clear so far, everybody? Awesome, thank you, thank you. Those on the chat that are responding. Okay. So this is the PERM flow chart. So again, I'm not talking about the two and the three, where we do the immigrant petition and where we do the adjustment of status to a green car. Here is what the PERM process is all about. For phase one is the prevailing wage determination. And I'm estimating all of them, give or take about six months, if everything goes well, okay? So phase one, that's what we determine what the job description is going to be, the requirements of the job description. And then after that, we move on to filing a prevailing wage determination with the Department of Labor. And I, I'm going to address each one of them more individually in each of the following slides. So this is, again, a general um, overview. 
phase two, if we get past the prevailing wage determination, and, and notice that I'm saying if, 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 because literally you have to finish one, we go back to the employer, we determine whether the results of that phase allow us to continue on to the next and then to the next and then to the next. So phase one completed, then we assess with the employer, can we move to phase two, which is recruitment where we recruit in the US labor market for minimally qualified US workers. If the recruitments result in no minimally qualified US workers, then we can move on to the last stage of this firm flowchart, which is the actual filing of the labor certification, which at the hope at the end is that we're gonna get a certified um, firm or labor certification. And actually I put it here at the bottom because I never, I'm so used to saying firm. Uh, and many times I get asked, what does it stand for? So it's the Program Electronic Review Management Perm. So I used to have a perm actually many, many years ago before I cut my hair. Uh, so Perm Program Electronic Review Management and something, in, in fact, historically, I've been doing this for so long, uh, the process before perm used to be, used to take forever, used to be very complicated. And when PERM came along, I think it's 2005, uh, we were thrilled because the first PERM applications, when the process literally took a month and that was, that was the marketing at, the, at that time. Oh, we're gonna move to the system that is gonna be so efficient and so effective and everything is gonna work well. Well, uh, it didn't work so well and now it's taken a year and a half. If, if there is no issues, but who knows, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm always optimistic and hope that better times will continue to come. Okay, this is important because when I go through this process with foreign nationals, uh, they forget the purpose of the perm. So it is to test the US labor market to determine if there is no minimally qualified US workers that are able, willing, qualified and available to fill the position. So this is very different than the normal recruitment. And, I, and it, again, the, wor the world of immigration has its, 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 its own bubble that does not typically relate to the real business world. And you're gonna see that very clearly as we go through the firm process, the stuff that we're having to do to find this US qualify US workers or the things that we don't do are very different than what any employer would do today. But again, the idea is to find minimally qualified. So typically an employer would be hiring for the most qualified US worker that they just want the best. And that is why they hire some foreign nationals because they are the most qualified. They are the best for the job. They bring in the diversity, the innovation, the new ideas, everything that the employers are looking for. The OL doesn't look at it that way. They're not a business, they're a bureaucracy. So for them, the employer needs to look at the person that most minimally can do the job, okay? So that has to be in the back of your minds when we're going through this process. And the other piece of the purpose of this firm is to determine whether the employment of this, the foreign worker will affect the wages of the US workers. Now, for most of my clients, you have a standard wage, whether you're a foreign national versus a, a, you know, a US worker, they're all on a scale, of they, you know, based on their, their, their qualifications, their tenure, the this, the other. But the Department of Labor, when PERM was implemented, had this idea that by bringing U.S. foreign nationals into the workforce, that was going to lower the wages of the U.S. workers. So in order for us to file a PERM or labor certification at the end of this process, we have to go to the Department of Labor with the proposed job description, the proposed requirements, and ask the Department of Labor to tell us what in their bright minds 
would be the proposed wage for this position. And that can create some issues that we have to deal with as we go through this process. So if we go through this process, we cannot file the perm if there is if the prevailing wage is realistic, say the Department of Labor comes back with, oh, you have to pay this worker $200,000 when the typical market rate is 75,000, of course, this is not gonna move forward. And, or there is minimally qualified US workers. So when I'm talking to you or we, Tyra, Ellen, um, and we are, we're, we're taking time to develop the requirements. We're taking time to establish what is required for the position. We're taking time to determine the qualifications that a foreign national brings to the job, trying to balance the, pre the potential prevailing wage versus the requirements of the position. This is the reason why we have to do that work, okay? The question, could you explain why phase two takes six months when the recruitment Ad is only up for one month? Sure, of course. So I'm gonna explain that when I go to the, I mean, I'm gonna take each one of these stages one by one. Um, so I will answer that question when we get there. And it, again, remember I say estimate times because otherwise um, I could be, just, I could talk about timelines forever because they're forever changing. So I'm just giving you estimates. This, for example, may take seven months. So, or it could take four. So I'm giving you an estimate. So phase one, job requirements, prevailing wage determination. In order to, when we begin this phase with all of you, uh, first we start looking at the likelihood of whether this firm is gonna get approved. And I'm going to talk somewhere towards the end about the triggers for audits and other things. But it's, it's a very detailed process to, and, and when I talk to employers and some of you, I, you know that I, we do research and investigation where we go, okay, let's just start looking at what, what the foreign national brought to the position, what the foreign national can help produce in terms of evidence that they have the requirements to determine whether we can move forward and whether this firm can get approved. So that's, that's one of the first things that we look at, likelihood of the firm, of, firm approval. And then we look at the immigration history of the foreign national. What is their remain, remaining time and status? Because if I start the, the green card process and the person is on their fifth year of H-1B status, most likely we're not gonna get through the perm process while that person still is in H-1B status. Ideally, the best time to start the, this process is sometime around year three or four of the H-1B because of the time that it's taking. And the importance of that is once you get past the perm and you can file an I-140 and get that I-140 approved, particularly for those of you that are from India, from China or other places that have long prevailing wage, not prevailing wage, but priority dates, the backlogs, the ability to have an I-140 approval allows for the employer to continue to extend that H-1B beyond the initial six years. But if you are at year five of your H-1B, that can cause a problem. And many times we have to recapture time or the foreign national has to go abroad so that they don't run out of his B status. There are strategies that we use all the time, case by case, but just know that these are all things that we have to take into consideration when we begin the green card process. And then of course, look at the education, the certification, the experience, the knowledge, all of that that the foreign national brought to the table. And this is important because the and I, I get this question asked a lot. Well, but I've been working with this employer for three years. Why can we not request three years of experience in, in, in the firm uh, requirements? And the reason goes back to that slide that I said to you, remember, a minimally qualified person. The Department of Labor, the way they look at it is if the employer hire you when you just came out of a school with no experience, well, they can hire someone else that came out of a school with no experience and train them. So that is very important. So 
the only time that we can or the ways that we use experience um, to add to this firm requirements are ideally when someone comes to the employer with potentially a year of prior work experience with another employer that is willing, they left in good terms, so always keep your doors open for a nationals because most likely you're going to go back to that prior employer potentially to get an experience letter uh, that will help with your firm application. So, and that experience, interestingly, this is something that sometimes, we, you know, people don't realize. So let's say that that employer has various branches with different um, tax ID numbers and you worked for, it's all employer C is the big umbrella, but employer C has branch A and branch B and that employee works at branch A with a different uh, federal identification number and then they transfer to branch B and we did a, an amended or a transfer, a new employer actually, new employer um, age. That experience with that first employer, employer A, could be used as an experience required for this labor certification. So that is, you know, something to remember. Um, if the foreign national worked at the at school during the school, uh, during you know when they were getting the U.S. masters, they were tech assistants or whatever. Sometimes we look at that evidence because we don't wanna to go to the market, particularly right now, with a minimal requirement of a master's degree in engineering. They, the employer will have very, uh, you know, a vast amount of, of, of applicants and that is not what we're looking for. The other little twist to the experience and the requirements of the position, and in fact, we're working on two of them right now, they don't come that often, but is if the future position that the foreign national is gonna take is 50%, clearly 50% different than the position that they have right now. For example, one of the cases that we're working on right now, the foreign national is a transportation engineer and he has been with our client for three years. During that time, they also became a PE. Um, so that now they're a professional engineer, they have their license. Once he got, got that license, his, his duties significantly changed because now he has a lot more responsibility. He can sign documents. Uh, so the position is clearly going to be 50% different than the position that he had when he was hired. So we're doing this for him. And he had no other experience. I mean, we went through everything that we can think of in terms of what else is there until we got to, okay, what is your position going to look like now that you have your license? And that made this possibility, that, that opened this possibility. Questions so far? Okay. Tell me that you're still with me. Say yes. Channel, chat box. Don't want to lose you. Okay, thank you. Okay, awesome. Okay. Oops, there was a question up there. Uh, do, 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 do. Maybe Ellen will catch it. Somebody asked a question. Do you create a new position every time? Yeah, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is a very intensive, at least the way we do it. Um, it's a very intensive process for us. And yes, what we do is we actually, in fact, this is, this is good for this slide. We define the job opportunity and the requirements in the context of the employer business. So we ask the employer to give us their job description for the position that they put, the foreign national is going to go into. Um, again, this is the, 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 the labor certification, which is something else that we have to remember. It's a future position. Typically, remember, we're not, he, the person is not going to be there for another two years, at least. So we have to remember that it's not the position that they're in today. It's the position that they're going to be in two years from now, three years from now, four years from now. 
So that has to be taken into consideration. So we define the job opportunity, we define what the employer's need are in the context of the business um, that, that we're talking to the employer. And we also then, the, a very important piece of this is balance the job description against a potential wage determination. And this is very important because again, I get for nationals that say, well, I have a US master's degree and I have five years of experience and I have 15 certifications. Well, again, that is not a minimal, minimally qualified person. So it's awesome that they have all of this. And that's why most likely you're there. Um, and I encourage you all, all of you to continue to advance your careers and, and, and get all the certifications. I mean, I'm where I am today and, and the, the team that is with me because we continue to study. I mean, it's, it's a life, life uh, opportunity, I, th I believe is, you know, it's awesome to be able to learn, uh, but don't do it because or not of, of your perm. This is the labor certification is its own kind of world. Uh, so when, we, again, the way the Department of Labor looks at this is they have for the prevailing wages, they have level one, level two, level three, level four. Level one is an entry level. So if someone, if, if the Department of Labor feels that someone with a bachelor's degree can perform the duties of the position in their world, and I am asking for a US master's as the minimum requirement for entry into that position, I'm already going to get a level two determination, which could be $10,000 more than what the foreign national is getting right now. And maybe, maybe not, they, get, they will get that in, in three or four years. So all of this goes into the determination as to what the requirements are gonna be. So if I say, okay, I want a U.S. master's plus, I don't know, say three more years of experience plus, you know, all of these tools and skills, and I'm most likely going to get a level three or a level four determination, which is going to bump that prevailing wage to a level four, which is potentially unrealistic. And potentially, if that comes back, the employer is going to say, there's no way that we're going to be able to pay that. So we're done. We cannot move forward with the firm process and the labor certification. So for you foreign nationals, um, think about all of this when, because the whole idea is to get through this process. And again, it's a balance of interest, yours and the employers. So all of that needs to come into play, okay? And I also wanna remind you all that this is an employer-driven process, not an employee-driven process. So even though we, definitely talk to the foreign nationals and the, you know, the experience letters, what can, be, can, what can be obtained, what cannot be obtained, what you brought to the position is it, things that we're gonna talk to you about at the end of the day. It is that employer that is gonna make the determination as to whether we, we move forward with the proposed job description with the proposed requirements or not, okay? So that's kind of the end of my slide here. Review with the employers and determine whether to proceed or not. Okay. So that is my general overview of phase one. Everybody's still with me. Okay. Phase two recruitment. And again, I put here estimated six months and I had a question about why the, the time. Um, so here are some of the things that happen in a step. So step two, I call it recruitment, but there is a lot more that goes into it, okay? One of the things that happens if the employer has not registered with the SWA, which is the state workforce agency, another very bureaucratic system that most employers do not use for recruitment of their labor force, at least most of the employers that I work with. Um, it, so it's, it's an account that many times they don't, they, don't, they don't keep up, they're not active with. Um, and even though sometimes we begin all of this before we begin the green card process, um, the, oh, I'm having an issue, maybe I'm okay. I have this open so you can see what's happening there. Oh, oh, so you guys are actually, huh, 
Okay. So let me, <laughs> so some of you are using the Q&A and some of you are using the chat and I didn't see that until right now. So I'll just use the chat for now, if you can, I will go back to the Q&A uh, just, just to make it easier for me. And you can send it to me directly if you want um, in, in the chat. Um, so, so thank you for bringing that up, Ellen. Um, okay, so back to the recruitment and why it takes long. So one of the agencies, well, actually we have to deal with two agencies before we even begin the recruitment, the SWA and the PARM, the Department of Labor. So sometimes this is pretty straightforward and the employer goes in and they activate their accounts and no problems. Sometimes there's been times that employers have had to go all the way to the top of the agency to get them to respond. So that could add a month, two months, three months to this process and it's very frustrating. So again, there's these two registrations that need to happen. Um, sometimes they take longer than we expect and sometimes it's, it's not an issue, but this takes time. So let me just come to the Q&A here just to make sure those experience with prior employers, whoops, oh shoot. How likely is the firm to get audited? Where that? Okay, I will answer that. Actually, that's one of my final uh, slides. Um, can the employee whom the company is applying for a green card behalf of see the firm job posting related to his or her case? Um, yeah, I mean they're going to be out in the recruitment world, but again, um, the it's it's not the employer it's not the employees so that the the employer is going to have the final say as to what gets put in the ad and and whatnot and again let me just go through it because i'm going through recruitment right now so that you can see uh where we're going um so before we get to recruitment again the the at least the, the foreign national and, and it's, it, it's the team. And as, as many of you that work with us know that we, I, I, to me is this teamwork that makes their world move <laughs> or their world works, work. Um, so you play a role for nationals and employers play a role, we play a role. So we, when we decide whatever the, and, and when I say we, it's all of us, and, and primarily the employer, they're, they're the orchestra director here. Um, we just play the guitar and the foreign national plays whatever, you, whatever instrument you decide to play. Um, the employer is gonna say, yeah, I'm good with this, but in, the foreign national helped us get there, okay? And then we get a prevailing wage determination. We talk to the employer and say, this is what the, the this is what the determination came, the Department of Labor gave us. Are you okay with that? Is this potentially what the foreign national is gonna make, you know, three, four, five years from now? That prevailing wage determination is not payable until the foreign national gets a green card. So again, it could be into the future. Um, so we move forward to the, with the recruitment. And the recruitment again is very unique <laughs> to PERM. And the way it works is there are certain, certain postings that have to happen. And that is the SWA, the State Workforce Agency job order that is at a minimum 30 days. Then a notice of posting on their work site and two Sunday ads. Those happen for everybody. And then there is three additional recruitment efforts. And then we strategize with the employer based on the list of available uh, recruitment efforts, which ones those are gonna be. We schedule it, we create a tentative schedule with the, with, the, with the employer as to when they're gonna run so that they kind of have an idea as to when they're gonna run. Again, we go through a third party to place all this, um, job orders. And back to the question as to why does it take more than 30 days? Well, putting an ad in the, probably the Jacksonville paper right now, um, the Sunday newspaper, and it's a newspaper of higher circulation, is costing about $1,000 for one of our perm ads. That same ad in the Chicago Tribune or whatever the main uh, paper is in Chicago is probably two or $3,000. 
uh, them same, that same ad in LA, same deal. And so we get those quotes back from the newspaper and tell the employer, this is what it's gonna cost. <laughs> And it's, you know, sometimes it's five thousand dollars for ads. That if they were recruiting a U.S. worker, they wouldn't even place any of these ads. So that's something else that takes time. You know, are, there are certain words that we can take out from the ad that are not essential, so that we can lower the cost. And then we go back to the agency, and, and until we come up with a, a, an ad or a various ads for all of this that works, and then we go and put them. Put them out there. They're not all going to happen at the same time because, again, the, the newspapers don't have the, their staff is minimal. The phones are not being answered; they used to be. All of this takes times, so way more than thirty days. And once all of this is done, potentially there are some U.S. workers that apply. If they apply and they are minimally qualified, they need to be assessed. They need to be interviewed. It, we need to determine, or we, the employer, needs to determine what is going to happen. Um, audit files need to be created with evidence of everything that has been done and the potential um, applicants or the applicants and what happens to those applicants. We also have a, a, a required quiet period after all those ads finish and up until that we cannot fire the term application if there are qualified workers, minimally qualified workers out there that have not been interviewed or have been addressed. So hopefully that answers that question of why it takes a while, okay? Questions so far? So and actually I kind of talked about, actually this, this slide, I talked about a lot of that as I was answering that question. So monitor, analyze the recruitment results, employer contacts and interviews qualified applicants, complete the report, uh, the recruitment report, complete the other file, review with employer, quiet period, da 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 da. Okay, so lots of um, lots of steps. Um, yeah. So Ellen, thank you. So uh, another. Uh, <laughs> Another, again, a lot of a strategy. Um, so it, it, you know, at least that's that's how we 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 work this. We have your best interest in mind, the best interest of the employer. Um, there are certain certain dates that we try to avoid, like holidays, when people are just going to be, you know, potentially sitting at home looking at the newspaper or looking at ads for jobs. Um, so if we're going into a major U.S. holiday, we try to avoid those, uh, so that also delays the process. So all of that come in, come into into play. So um, okay, so this is this is important for employers and for nationals. Assessment of applicants. So let's say that there are ten people that apply for the position that was posted. Um, and particularly, again, we in 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 the market that we're in, and we, we again, we're strategic about where we place the ads. Um, if um, minimally qualified applicants apply, they can only be disqualified if the applicant is not a U.S. worker. So, and the, the employer may not know this, whether they're a U.S. worker or not, because they typically cannot ask as to what is your status, immigration status, until they're offered a job and that offer that offer is accepted. But if the foreign, if the worker is in working on H-1B status and somehow they know that, they're not considered a U.S. worker. But if anybody else is a U.S. worker and legal permanent residents are considered um, U.S. workers, asylees are considered legal workers. So um, they have to keep that into consideration. <clears throat> Failure to meet the job minimal requirements and cannot be trained within a reasonable period upon the job training. Failure to do well or attend the job, a job interview for job for work references, so the re references cannot be checked. Refusal to take certain employer required tests or perform performance tests. Uh, withdraws the application or unwillingness to accept the, the, the wages or to relocate if necessary. So these are some of the um, documented, um, the, the lawful reasons why a, uh, an employer could reject 
U.S. workers. And now it's so, it, it's not, it's not a lot. Um, and it, it many times really requires having an in-depth knowledge of what that person can do and brings to the table. So that brings us back to the phase one and why it's so important why we spend so much time trying to work with you and the employer as to what are the requirements of the position because unless we have some solid requirements in there that the foreign national can meet and that there is evidence that the foreign national meets the, re the requirements, it is very difficult to disqualify a U.S. worker. Okay. And I think this is my last slide for this one. Um, again, just to drive the point even more, can a U.S. worker be qualified even if they do not meet all the minimum requirements? And the answer, according to the Department of Labor, is yes. If that applicant can acquire the necessary skills within a reasonable period of on-the-job training. So again, think about this because this is, this is important, okay? Questions so far, is everybody with me? I'm gonna move to this third phase of this process. Yes, thank you, thank you. Okay, I appreciate that you're, you're with me, awesome. Okay, fabulous. All right, phase three, labor certification. So whew, we made it. We made it through the job description. We've made it through the prevailing wage determinations. We made it through recruitment and you know we're good to go, labor certification. So here is where we fill out a very extensive form uh, that keeps on growing and is in the process of being changed again. Um, that is called the firm or the, or the labor certification. Um, when we are here, the labor certification requires a review of the foreign nationals immigration status. I mean, we do that, as you remember from the first phase, uh, we start there, but this one puts it all in paper. Um, and this, what is here, um, carries all the way to to the green card process. So again, we take the time to review and to check and because what you put here is what is gonna be on the I-140, it's gonna it's going to be on the adjustment of the status. And now quite often the I-140 unit is looking at what was put in the H-1B petition to make sure that everything is matching. So for some of you that have worked with us through this process, and we ask you, okay, if it would be awesome if you have an I-140, if you have a labor certification that was filed by another attorney, another employer, if you can get even pieces of that, it's important for us because that is already in the hands of USCIS or in the hands of the Department of Labor. And we don't want to contradict what they have. We can maybe modify it a little bit, but it shouldn't be black and white. So that is why quite often, again, same deal with the H-1Bs, we're doing an H-1B transfer, you had an H-1B from a prior employer, we want to see what the government already has in their files so that we can be consistent in, in what is going forward, okay? So part of this labor certification, this is our last chance before this gets filed to just review what is required? Does the beneficiary has everything that is required for the position? One of the things that I forgot to mention um, in phase one is when we start looking at, say we decide, okay, the position requires a US master's degree and 12 months experience, one year. And the foreign national says, yeah, I can have a letter written by my employer in India or my employer in Alaska, whatever. That is going to say da 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 yeah, 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 don't worry, we can get this letter. I am not gonna move forward with filing the prevailing wage determination until that letter is in hand because I've been there before and sometimes that letter for whatever reason does not come through. And now I have a prevailing wage determination that requires that the person, and I'm getting ready to file labor certification that requires 
that this person has 12 months of experience and we don't have evidence of it. And the, the next step, the I-140, I'm gonna be required to file that letter. So really we have to analyze everything we have as we go through this process and not move to the next one until one is completely finished and we have the evidence that we need. Um, so labor certification, it requires input from again, all the team, the employee has his part, the employer has their part, we have our part. Um, audit file is finalized um, and is kept for five years. We keep a full copy of that audit file in case, of the, in case the employer is audited. Um, so this is part of the draft. So this is the first page, I think, of the perm that is there on the screen. Um, file the perm with the Department of Labor. This is for employers. Um, we also coordinate with you very closely when we file the perm because the minute we file the perm, the Department of Labor sends out two emails. Um, let me see if that's on the next, no, I think it's here. Um, the Department of Labor sends two emails, one to us and to you basically saying that the, that the perm has been filed. And then the next email goes to the employer that basically says, um, you know, the perm certification has been filed for you and you need to answer four questions that are not very straightforward. Um, so we guide you through that and let you know how to answer those questions and that we have filed and to wait for this, you know, be on the lookout for, the, for this email from the Department of Labor, because if that email is not responded to, then the process stops until the employer responds to that email. And if they don't, the Department of Labor follows up with them. So again, this is just another little um, piece on, on this process. Then what happens? So the Department of Labor issues, so best case scenario, they issue the labor certification. Again, estimated processing times without an audit about six months. If the Department of Labor issues an audit, they only give us 30 days to respond to this audit. That is why, and, and it's a very, very detailed um, request. Um, all the applicants, their background, their resumes, the reasons why they were not qualified, business necessity as to why the position requires a U.S. master's degree, if, if they think it requires a bachelor's degree, um, a whole bunch of other stuff. So all of that needs to be ready to go before we file the perm because 30 days, by the time it comes to us, by the time you get it, and by the time we finish responding, the 30 days are gone. Um, so, and if it goes into audit, it, it's taking about 12 months, maybe a little less. We actually just got a, a response to an audit um, yeah, that was certified finally. And I think that one took about 10 months, but it, it's, it varies. Um, or they could issue a denial. And if they issue a denial, is sometimes so you can request a review um, of why the case was denied. Typically it goes back to the Department of Labor to a supervisor of the person that issues the denial. And it's kind of useless um, unless it's something either very minor or that somehow we think that there's something that potentially can be overcome. Sometimes if the foreign national has enough time or, or a way to stay in a status and we file um, the perm and in various factors, but um, we do a lot of work to try not to get here. Um, the new perm can be filed if there is a pending. Oh, this is also very important that another reason why sometimes we don't even um, go into this um, um, challenge in the denial is because if the denial, if, if we file a, a request for reconsideration or review for that same position, until that is adjudicated, which could take who knows how long, then we cannot file a new perm. So that also, it, you know, it, it, it interferes with the potential options for, for the case. Okay, somebody asked about this. So what, what triggers audits? 
Um, some of the things that trigger audits are foreign language requirements. So many of you, when we talk to you, um, talk to me and say, well, you know, our, our client has offices in China, or our client has offices in India, and our client has offices in Japan, or South America, or whatever. And the fact that I speak Spanish, or whatever it is, is a benefit, because da 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 Well, if your job is a civil engineer, and I put the requirement that the person, you know, should be bilingual, that is definitely going to trigger an audit. So I avoid any language requirements as much as I can, unless is, you know, a French teacher, but of course, uh, but that's not, those are not typically the cases that I have. So foreign language requirements, it's a no in my world. Um, job requirements that exceed what the DOL considers a minimum requirement. And again, this is where the, a lot of the analysis comes in. The foreign national has a US bachelor's degree, sometimes a PhD. Um, that's why they have the position because the, the, the employer is looking for the most qualified person. The Department of Labor says, no, I don't care about that. If you can, someone can do their job with a bachelor's degree, it doesn't matter to me that the person has a PhD. So this is key. Uh, how do we balance the background of the employee, the foreign national versus the need of the employer versus the what Department of Labor considers minimal requirements? And that's what many times business necessity comes into play. The employer would say to me, yeah, well, um, you know, I at least need a U.S. bachelor's degree because A, B, C, D, whatever it is. And then we use that as, as you know, in, in our, when we're crafting this, that's business necessity argument. If we get audited, that is why we're going to tell the Department of Labor, well, we had to request this because this is the, you know, the, this is not just a general engineering firm they're dealing with multi-billion dollar contracts and, and projects and this and the other one that requires higher skills that potentially your minimal level employee or your, you know, the, the minimally require people that the Department of Labor is looking at. The same thing goes with the next one here on do unduly restrictive or requirements that are specifically tailored to the beneficiary. Um, it's a balance requirements of degree, but no work or other experience. So again, in, in the case of the position requires a bachelor's degree and nothing more. Well, and, and then I tell the Department of Labor, nope, we did all the required um, recruitment and no one qualified. That would be hard to believe. Uh, recent layoffs in the field, applicants that have close family ties to the employer and interest in the company, applicant that received training uh, or experience with the employer and, and there is random audit. So those happen um, despite the facts of things that would have triggered audits, okay? How would be, are we doing so far? I'm at 2.53 in terms of time. Has this been helpful? Have you found some gems of information in here? Um, some additional questions that you may have for me. Okay. Oh, nice. Okay. Can you get promoted and receive? Can you get promoted and receive a salary junk during the perm process? Um, yes, that is possible. So um, again, the the. The Department of Labor is going to issue a prevailing wage. If you are making more than what the prevailing wage is at the time that you are getting a green card, kudos to you. And yeah, it, it does not prevent, a, 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 what do you call it, a, a race. And in fact, and again, this is a, now something that, and that, that question actually uh, brings something else to my mind, because what sometimes happens is um, not that they got a raise, but they want to transfer the person to a different position while the perm process is in play. And this is one of the things that per, the, the immigration process is not 
it's not a kind process for anybody. And believe me, I've been through it. I, I, I've been through this whole thing. That's, that's why I crazy do what I do. But um, it, this is not a kind process. It's not a process, sadly, that is that is created to stimulate foreign, foreign talent coming to the United States. So yes, you can receive a raise, but let's say that I filed this um, firm for the title and the duties of, um, I don't know, a civil engineer, I'm just, I'm just picking that. And somehow the foreign national took extra classes on their own and they're, they really want to do, I don't know, design engineering, whatever, just, just come up with something different. Um, that will undo the process, okay? So a raise, a promotion within the same channel, it's okay. But if we're veering onto something, or, or say the foreign national applies for a position, well, that is, you know, was open and it's a, you know, it's a promotion, big promotion, different title, different department, different da da da, will win in the middle of this that would cause a problem because that is not the position that is being supported by this firm, okay? So thank you for a, a, asking that question because I, that comes up. Um, for any of the phases, if we go over the expiration of the H1B, for example, when needs to happen? Good question. So again, remember that, so the H1B is three years and then and I got another question here about the change in the word location with same employer. So let me, let me see. So as to the H-1B, remember one of the first slides that we talked about was the, we, one of the first things that we look at is, is this feasible and how much time does a person have in that status? So from the beginning, we can start thinking, are we going to make it or not? And if we're not going to make it, we have to have a strategy of how to, how to get there. And sometimes, the foreign national needs to leave the United States because they ran out of status and the process continues. So you don't need to be in the United States for this labor certification or the I-140 to take place. Um, we have done some uh, that the, the foreign national was never in the United States. They only came in once the green card was issued. They're rare situations. It, in this particular case that I'm talking about, the person was a consultant to the U.S. company, and they have been working as a consultant for the U.S. company for a number of years. And eventually they said to me, well, you know what, we would love for him to come. And he would have wanted to come because he wanted his uh, family to live in the United States, the kids, the kids to go to school here. But while this whole process was going on, he just came in and did the consulting, went back home and, all, you know, it took two and a half years or so for that to happen in his case, and it was fine. So, but for you, someone that is on an H-1B that is gonna run out, again, if we're doing it within that three, four year time frame of your H-1B status, we should make it to the end of getting an I-140 certified so that you can continue to extend your H-1B. In fact, last year, two cases that we had were like so, so tight in timing. Um, when we mapped this out, we thought, oh my gosh, if, if any, anything goes wrong, we, I mean, we just had very little time, maybe one or two months of, of, of balance of the of free time in a way. And what happened is we got the certified perm, the person maybe had, I don't know, four months of H1B status left. We turn around and file the I-140 premium process, the I-140, the I-140 came in turn around and file the, the H-1B premium process, the H-1B, and got the H-1B for three years. Um, but again, we, we tracked that time. Those two, in those two cases happen, and the, the people are in H-1B status now. They were from India, um, and you know it, it worked. Uh, let's see. What about the change in work location with the same employer? Um, that is a good question. We actually had somebody that the company changed. That doesn't happen that often. That's something else that we talk about when we when we when we strategize this. Um, you know, where is the person going to be working? And again, this this is not a this is not a friendly system. It's just not. So you you have to kind of look at that magic ball and kind of try to figure out what's going to happen. Um, last year, with everything that was going on, we had a company that. Um, closed down the location for which we had filed a prevailing wage. 
and there that so that location is 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 no longer their 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 place of employment is a completely different location and we had a prevailing wage for that location that closed and we had to start all over again we had to file a new prevailing wage for the new work location because the department of labor was not going to take a prevailing wage for a, a location that was not going to be the one um, that the foreign national was going to work in so good questions okay um Yeah, so can the labor certification be filed for multiple work locations? Yes, and in, yes, and the Department of Labor is going to typically give you the higher wage of what, you know, of all the locations. So, yeah, um, and what's the average cost of the whole process? Tell me what, what is the cost to you to get a green card, and I'll tell you. Um, what happens if my H-1B is being filed simultaneously while I'm applying for a perm? Um, it doesn't matter. Your H-1B is in a separate bucket, okay? So it, they don't necessarily coincide if I, if, if that makes, so the, remember the perm is the Department of Labor. The H-1B adjudication, um, it's, it's, it's its own, so it, it should not matter. Um, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I was kind of joking when I said, you know, how, how much is it gonna cost to get your green card? And to some degree, it's, it's a very expensive process. And as you can see through here, um, the recruitment, the, 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 the fees that, that go with this, uh, it's, it's a very long and intensive process. We break it down for the employer so that we move, we do the prevailing wage determination first, and then if that's satisfactory and, and we can move on to the next step, we then we move to the next step and then we move to the next step. Uh, but yeah, and Ellen saying a couple, it is, it, it takes, um, it, it's just saying, in a way you're almost kind of going into litigation with the Department of Labor and USCIS for your benefit so you can get a green card. Um, so, here it is. Uh, great things are done by a team of people working together. Uh, that is my philosophy. That's our philosophy. That's thankfully the philosophy of a lot of you that are our clients. Um, we appreciate you. We value as clients. And I am thrilled that you were here with me. Um, you know, we're here to to continue to make uh, the United States the reason why we're here, uh, I, I, I and, and our whole team and the employers that we work with and you guys, uh, we believe that uh, it's a salon of opportunity and we're here to help you. So again, thank you so much for being with us, for participating. I appreciate you and look forward to a smooth green card process for all of you. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.